Reaching for the skies continues with the machine that changed war forever, fighters. One airplane, above all others, demonstrates man's mastery of the skies. The fighter. Fighters are the thoroughbreds of the airplane world. Theirs is a demanding task to seek out and destroy the aircraft of the enemy. So they are designed to fly at the very limits of what's possible, extracting the last ounce of performance from airframe and engine. The same demands are made of the men who fly them. That's why fighter pilots are an elite among aviators. Fighter pilot is an attitude. It is cockiness. It is aggressiveness. It is self-confidence. It is a streak of rebelliousness. And it is competitiveness. But there's something else. There's a spark. There's a desire to be good to do well in the eyes of your peers and in your own eyes. Understand it if you fly from A to B in straight and level and merely climb and descend. You're moving through the basement of that vault of blue. A fighter pilot is a man in love with flying. A fighter pilot sees not a cloud, but beauty. Not the ground, but something remote from him. Something that he doesn't belong to as long as he's airborne. He's a man who wants to be second best to no one. Many regard the United States F-16 as the best fighter in the world today. It's fast, highly maneuverable, and deadly. The essential qualities of every successful fighter plane. In World War II, there were a few fighters more successful than the P-51, the Mustang. Introduced in 1943, it was the long-range fighter with the job of escorting Allied bombers over Germany. Unlike earlier fighters, such as the Spitfire or Lightning, it had the range to fly deep into the Reich. Once there, it had the performance to beat or match every German aircraft sent up against it. More than any other fighter, the Mustang destroyed the Luftwaffe. All of a sudden, this new airplane appeared on the scene. The P-51, we knew nothing of its maneuverability, how far it would go. We discovered it was a, quite a remarkable machine. It was the same engine as the Spitfire. You knew you had more power than you'd ever had before. You could feel the acceleration on takeoff. Of course, you were kind of pushing back in your seats like when you take off in a jet. 
this is an exhilarating feeling. You feel like that now you've got something you can do great things with. Beautiful little airplane. Fell in love with that immediately. Its ability is legend. Its range, adequate firepower, comfort, durability, reliability. Everything about it was something that a fighter pilot dreamed of, and there it was. So to this day, my heart really is in that P-51 cockpit. We felt more secure in the Mustang than any other airplane. We felt we really had something that we could fight the German on an equal basis. And this is very important, to have the confidence. The bomber boys used to brag about, oh, we can go in by ourselves. They, they were bomber boys. They wanted to prove that, that they could do it. Well, of course, they couldn't. They took terrible losses. It was a raid to Berlin. Beautiful, beautiful day. The B-17 box that we were escorting was at 32,000 feet. How those men stood at those open windows, I'll never know, but there they were. Suddenly, that box of bombers were hit by waves of Focke-Wulf 190. It was carnage. They knocked down 52 of them in about three minutes. And we were sandwiched, one or two of us, in between these attacking waves. And of course, we didn't stop them. You can't stop a determined attack, well planned and executed. The best way to defend the bombers is to catch the enemy before he's in position to attack. Catch them when they're taking off, or when they're climbing, or when they're forming up. Don't think you can defend the bomber by circling around him. It's good for the bomber's morale and bad for tactics. thousand bombers, a bomber stream of a thousand, that's a lot of land up in the air trying to cover. And they're going to get in there some way or another and got a few of those, so uh, we couldn't cover them all the time, but we did a pretty good job. Without the Mustang, it would have been pretty bad. Throughout the war, fighter pilots were glamorous figures, standing out as individuals in a striking contrast to the anonymous scale of modern warfare. They captured the public imagination. They seemed like knights of old, jousting in the sky. Most nations had their aces. Pilots with a special flair for shooting down the enemy. Scores of German aces had over a hundred victories to their credit. Air forces were quick to exploit their achievements, turning them into heroes to raise morale at home. There's one ingredient that I think you can always spot in an ace. He's usually a very light-hearted type of fellow. He likes a lot of fun. Good drinker, usually. Uh, chaser. He takes things very lightly, but there's something else that you don't see. And his dedication. And there was very little arrogance about it. There was a certain amount of humility. Blue section out there. We were all extremely proud um, to be in the position we were. There was the odd individual who um, had so little between the ears that he thought that uh, nothing on earth could ever defeat him, and, and they didn't normally last. understand 
aerial combat is not a set piece two men pitting themselves one against the other and the best man wins aerial combat is often surprise hit flash run crazy business for lots of aircraft in the sky. A few seconds later, you couldn't see an aircraft anywhere. This is the most eerie thing about dogfighting. All the plans that had been laid were destroyed, and everyone was down here or over here or going back. It was chaos, of course, but hardly chaos. The aircraft tries to buck around like a horse because the recoil from eight guns is quite considerable. I was shot up many a time. And the strange thing is, in the air, you can smell cordite or hot lead. And it's the most unpleasant smell, particularly when you're flying something full of high octane fuel. It's a catch 22. You can't teach it unless you've been there. If you haven't been there, you can't learn it. And the point that cannot be trained is that in the first couple of seconds of one of those engagements, somebody dies. It's very difficult for the inexperienced pilot to accept. You sense very quickly in an engagement the ability of your opponent. He was a new kid. You almost felt sorry for him, or he was an old head. And the 109 in an experienced pilot's hand with a very formidable adversary. Well, the first kill is the FW-190. I just pulled in a little tighter and put my sights about 10 degrees beyond the nose and hit him right in the cockpit. And he just sort of rolled over and went in. Well, whether that scene was not as delightful as I thought it would be, and I wanted to get away from what I'd done. I've often thought about that. But I was very excited about it, and I was very proud. Flying ground attack fighters is less glamorous than air combat, but more dangerous. It uh, was personal. Strafing the front, bombing the railroad yard trying to bomb a bridge. Very personal. You were right in the front line. Uh, down to earth, we called it. Tremendous satisfaction in blowing up a goods wagon. To sinking a barge full of petrol. Strafing an airfield. All highly dangerous. But there's a certain satisfaction in destroying something. War is not supposed to be fun, but if you can imagine seeing a railroad train going down the track and there's a steam engine out in front just dying to be shot. And when you shoot it, a great cloud of steam comes out the sides and up through the smokestack. The train shudders to a halt. Oh, you you're, you're filled with joy. Fighter bombers like the Typhoon and Thunderbolt added a fresh horror to war's grim catalog, destroying the enemy whenever he tried to move in daylight. By 1944, the German armies were in retreat. Their airfields lost in the Allied advances or destroyed by the onslaught from the air, the Luftwaffe operated from forest clearings or highways. The losses were colossal. Over 500 aircraft a week. Starved of fuel, short of trained pilots, they flung everything they had into the air to check the Allied offensive. New aircraft were developed in the search for a wonder weapon that could turn the tide. Most formidable of all these pioneering achievements was the Messerschmitt 262. It was the world's first jet fighter to see action, but came too late to save the Luftwaffe. By 1944, the British had their own jet fighter. 
the Gloucester Meteor, though it was never used against enemy aircraft. The arrival of these two jets in the European skies swept in a new era of flight. Six years later, in the Korean War, jet fighters did clash in air combat. Many of the American pilots were veterans of World War II, well-trained and battle-hardened. Their principal weapon was the newly introduced F-86 Sabre. In it, they achieved almost undisputed dominance of the skies over Korea. By the end of the war, Sabres had claimed nearly 800 enemy aircraft destroyed for the loss of 78 of their own. The transition from piston-driven, propeller-driven aircraft to jet-propelled aircraft was not as dramatic a change as one might imagine. Flying at altitude to conserve fuel was a change. The speeds weren't all that violent, because speed is relative. If he's going 600 and you're going 600, what's the difference? Zero. I was in the first fighter group that had the first 35 production models of the F-86A-1. We wrecked over 20 of them. It wasn't all our fault. They just weren't built well. There was a new step forward. Pieces kept flying off. Engines quit. Tails would go fluttering. It was really a wild ride. It was very seldom that you took off without landing under emergency conditions. The opposition was principally the Chinese with some Soviet volunteers. The communist pilots were no match in skill and experience for their American and allied opponents. But their aircraft, the Soviet-built MiG-15, was a revelation. An excellent fighter powered, ironically, by an engine based on a Rolls-Royce design. It outperformed all the American fighters except the Sabre, and in some features was superior to that as well. Its appearance sent a shockwave through the West. The scene was set for history's first jet fighter combats. The 86 was a good dogfight machine. It was like a P-51, but it was much faster. Good visibility, rugged, reliable. The later models didn't fly apart. The time span between the two wars was not great enough for us to have lost the knowledge that had been gained. The Russians, like America and her allies, used Korea as a proving ground where their pilots could gain experience of the new shape of aerial warfare. The use of air power in Korea stimulated a highly comprehensive program of technical innovation and aircraft development between the superpowers. The MiG-15 jet fighter fathered a whole family of MiGs, each one more sophisticated than the last, equal and sometimes superior to the performance of the new fighter planes of the West. Before long, the Soviet Union had one of the biggest and most up-to-date air forces in the world and supplied a host of nations with its aircraft. Since Korea, pilots of the superpowers have never again met in combat. But the Cold War that followed created a different kind of confrontation between the air forces of the two opposing alliances. To this day, the air crews of both sides keep up a constant vigil, tracking every move the other makes. Airborne warning systems have become an essential part of the armory. Aircraft packed with electronic surveillance equipment search for signs of a surprise attack. Few skies are potentially more dangerous than the airspace over Europe, where the powers of NATO and the Warsaw Pact share a frontier. So when an unidentified airplane appears on the radar screen, fighters are sent up to investigate and intercept the intruder. Stand by, stand by.
These days, tension has eased between the superpowers. So this confrontation between Soviet bomber and the RAF tornado ends with a friendly wave. Elsewhere, fighters have had bloodier battles. June the 5th, 1967. Around 300 Israeli aircraft, mainly French-built fighter bombers, prepare to launch the most decisive airstrike in history. Their target? the air forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. However sweet the victory, for the pilots, it remains an impersonal experience. The only thing that you hear is a lot of noise that comes from your earphones, the commanding of the whole controlling net that are in the air don't hear the shooting. Maybe you can hear your shooting, your strafing of your cannon, but you don't hear the hits, you don't hear the shouts, you don't see the face and you don't see the blood of the enemy in front of you. In just two days, the air war is over. In a few devastating hours, the Israelis have disabled all but one of the Arab airfields destroying 393 aircraft on the ground and shooting down 23. With total command of the skies, Israeli fighters can now give tactical support to their soldiers as they advance across the desert. Then, in another annihilating strike, they catch the Egyptian army in the Mitla Pass and leave it in ruin. I flew over it. Uh, it was very sad. And looking down and, and seeing remains of burnt out vehicles, thousands, literally thousands of vehicles that were not going to go anywhere anymore. It looked like an enormous scrapyard. In all its years of combat, it is the jet fighter's most impressive victory. In Vietnam, the air war was very different. OK, we got jet fighters. Here, the United States was up against a guerrilla army. Concealed in the Vietnamese jungles, hard to find and harder to hurt. Oh, looks pretty good. Uh, I'd like you to keep your fast uh, as deep as possible. The main role for the fighters was ground attack, launching airstrikes against enemy positions. The American fighters were fast, electronically sophisticated, and delivered a formidable punch. But they were not designed to fight a guerrilla war. When fighters attacked targets in the north, they met a more conventional enemy, North Vietnamese MiGs. You only had missiles, so you had to maneuver to get yourself into missile firing position. No snap shooting. Fast, slashing, quick action, and then gone. Their pilots, damn good, very good, they were very aggressive, they knew what they were doing, they flew with good discipline, I have great respect for them. Most versatile of the American fighters was the Phantom. It was the workhorse of Navy and Air Force, equally good at air combat or on a bombing run. The Smoke and Thunder Hog F-4 is one of the finest airplanes in the world. You know, an airplane is like your wife. She has her good points, her bad points. You love the good ones, and you learn to live with the bad ones. The F-4 has got a, a lot of good points. And if I had my choice of flying a MiG-17, a MiG-19, or a MiG-21, I would rather fly the Phantom. She has 17,900 pounds of thrust per engine. Very reliable. It turns like a truck. She won't outturn a MiG, but you know the good points of your weapon system that outperforms and outclimbs the enemy. So you go vertical. Now he can't go vertical with it. I would have to say that the missile was the most frightening aspect. Uh, flak is flak. They had more flak than the Germans had. It was deadlier. It was radar guided. It shot down more people than the missiles did. But there's something terribly personally impersonal about being the target of an oncoming SAM missile. 
you know exactly how a fish feels in a barrel. That thing is coming at you. It means to kill you. The missile, quite frankly, was terrifying. Washington gauged the success of the missile upon those fired versus those that hit us, never appreciating that the percentage of those fired that missed was very high because we were desperately avoiding being killed, sometimes to the detriment of mission accomplishment. But more often, we did it with great skill and cunning <laughs> and managed to complete the mission regardless. But when you've been shot at by 24 of those things in about a three minute period, as my flight and I were on one occasion, you find yourself right down on the deck, which is no place to be over North Vietnam, because even the school children are shooting at you. And uh, the missiles did that. That didn't happen too often, but it happened often enough to make a Christian out of you if you were a pagan. The withering anti-aircraft fire a deadly mixture of flak batteries and SAM missiles made attacking North Vietnamese targets a dangerous business. By the war's end, over 1,800 American aircraft had been destroyed by enemy action. 2,000 air crew lost, and many pilots the prisoners of an unsympathetic enemy. We knew how our people were being treated. And if you have an enemy that you can hate, it's much easier to go after him with venom in your fangs than it is for someone that you've never really had much to think about, then you're just fighting because of his differences. During the years after War II, technology had vanished tremendously. People with many, many degrees climbed into their crystal palaces and their golden domes and forgot. The lessons of the past were forgotten. Much was driven by the superior knowledge and the ego of the designers. They didn't appreciate the use of fighters. They'd been thinking so long about nuke strike. What do you need a gun for? Oh, the sidewinder will solve everything. He didn't put a gun on the F-4. I flew an entire year of combat without a gun on the F-4. I managed to shoot down four MiGs. But if I'd had a gun on that F-4, I say unequivocally, without any doubt in my mind, I could have shot down nine more MiGs. We went into Vietnam going full circle. The tactics that we used were antiquated. The weapons that we used were utilized to shoot down Russian bombers, not by turning MiG-17s, 19s, or 21s. The pilots were not trained properly. We went in with reckless abandonment and got our socks knocked off. For a power like ours to go into a country like theirs and fight against their airplanes, we did very poorly. U.S. military chiefs, responding to this and what they saw as the growing Soviet threat, set out to improve their tactics. The Navy introduced the Top Gun Weapons School, and the Air Force followed with its own answer, the Aggressor Squadron. Today will be MiG-01, Flight of Four, simulating MiG-21, against Cobra-01, a flight of two F-15s. We'll plan on carrying four aphids. We will regenerate after each engagement. The Air Force's aim was to simulate as closely as possible the reality of air combat. That called for a force that flew and fought exactly like a potential enemy. A peacetime opponent pilots could fly against to prepare them for war. One of the keys to any war, is historians will tell you forever and ever, and it's valid right now, and that's knowing your enemy. And that's one of the things that I pride myself on and all the aggressors do is that we know our enemy. We study them in depth. We'll go for the tally-ho. I'm a commander of a uh, Soviet fighter squadron. I fly an aircraft. It's a U.S. aircraft, but it's very uh, similar in size and performance characteristics of the earlier Soviet uh, fighters. The uh, MiG-21 and MiG-23 are pretty close in size. 
I train like the Soviets do. We study the man. We study his hardware, his armament. You walk around our squadrons, you'll see uh, Soviet flags, pictures of uh, Soviet heroes. We wear a hammer and sickle on the helmet and a hammer and sickle on the equipment. Red star on our sleeve. We are basically a Soviet fighter squadron. In fact, I personally feel that we probably execute Soviet tactics better than the Soviets do, but that's a personal feeling. The aggressor squadron takes off to play its part in red flag, a combat exercise that's fought out on the United States Air Force's vast bombing and gunnery range in the Nevada desert. An elite force among fighter pilots, they will be the enemy, adding a realistic ingredient to the training of the pilots who fly against them. Challenging the aggressors is a new breed of super fighters. They carry an awesome array of armament and fly twice the speed of sound. In red flag, pilots can use live weapons against unmanned targets. Aerial combat hits are scored electronically, but for the men taking part, the battlefields reel up. The training that we do at red flag gives me feelings that were very, very similar to what I experienced in, uh, in the, my combat experience in Southeast Asia. Bandit spit out northwest three miles. Look across the circle for the other one about a mile. The ultimate challenge of, of uh, life or death struggle. Um, there, the elements of that are all here at Red Flag. We will never achieve true fidelity because we certainly won't be shooting real bullets and missiles at each other in this program. But short of that, uh, it's the best we have. Okay, the lead just went in a right-hand turn to south. Come hard left, 180. Check on the nose a mile. Today's air battle will probably start out at longer ranges with missiles being employed, probably by both sides. And as those airplanes approach a common merge together, then the fight becomes more of the classic visual dogfight. You got a bogey, six o'clock for six day of the dogfight is alive and well, and it, it is just as intense and it's just as brutal as it ever was before. The only difference is that now we have the advent of using a couple of extra weapons other than the gun. That dogfight can either be the close-in one with the gun, classic one from World War II Korea, or it can also be a little further out to where we can use some of our tactical missiles. In World War II, you were limited almost uh, exclusively to uh, the visual arena, and Chuck Yeager makes no bones about the fact that he was a highly successful fighter pilot because he had better eyes than anybody else in the squadron. Well, today, you could wear bifocals and probably beat Chuck Yeager in his World War II airplane because you'd see him on your radar much sooner and be able to employ a sophisticated weapon against him before he ever saw you with his real good eyes. So that's the difference between the past fighter pilots and what we're seeing today. After the battle comes the debriefing. The whole exercise has been monitored and recorded. Blue air to air players. BVR with radar missiles if we in the could, calm of the computer room, screen. pilots can analyze how they performed in the heat of combat. Okay, Paul, right here, we had just gotten done being engaged south of Reveille there, and we're trying to run out east and get our formation back to line abreast and uh, just regain some SA. You can see number six here rolling up. I'm not picking you up visually. I'm looking back at the wingman. 
and right about here as you take your shot, number two, or number six in this case, the wingman, picks you up a little bit late. You can see as your missile times out, I get a brake call right about now, and I go into a hard left turn. But as we can see from the, uh, the replay here, it's a little late. There I go into my turn. How to train fighter pilots for the stress of combat has always been a challenge. Before World War II, this was one American approach to overcoming disorientation. The Russians were equally concerned about the effect of high-speed maneuvers on the brain and had their own rigorous method of preparing flyers for the experience. By the end of World War II, the U.S. Air Force had devised a primitive simulator which helped thousands learn to fly and beat the problem of disorientation. All right, well, I'm going to do it this particular time is I'm going to give you control and I'm also going to take away your lights. At this particular point, you are accelerating to 17 RPMs, which is three quarters of a G. Today, and what a I want turn to on the vertifuge is the way of testing a would-be fighter pilot's capacity to cope level. with disorientation. All right, right now you're in a roll position of 1.4. It's an important uh, test. Even at relatively low physical uh, stresses, a pilot can find his brain deceived and unable to give a true picture of the way the airplane is flying. It's a problem that causes the biggest dropout among flyers. And I want you to look at them while this is happening. As you can see, your vision is becoming affected by spatial disorientation. And also, if you feel any rolls to the right or to the left, okay. that's also a perceived roll. Uh, I'm getting a nose down on uh, the left bank. I'm going to go through the checklist real quick. Data station? Ready. Data station is ready. Operator? Operator is ready. Medical? Medical is ready. Final ready. Final countdown. 9 Gs, 15 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, Throughout one. the history of flight, pilots in the cockpit have had to withstand heavy pressures on their body. The power and turning ability of today's fighters can push forces eight or nine times heavier than gravity through the human frame. The centrifuge puts a pilot through a similar experience. Under these intense stresses, he must still be able to fly and fight. To assess his ability to do this, he has to fly a computerized course. The lights nice and bright. Release the stick. Unload. Unload. Keep straining. Keep straining. Relax. Catch your breath. Okay. You have any light loss? Yeah. Thank you. It's a good ride. Flying today's fighter is undoubtedly one of the most demanding jobs in the it imposes intense physical, emotional, and intellectual pressures all at once. And as fighters become more complex, the strain on the pilot increases. Research is going on to find new ways of helping him fly his aircraft. Scientists are studying how a pilot's brain gathers information through his senses. How it builds up a picture of his situation, interprets it, and then makes his decision. They need to know each stage of the process because their aim is to design a super cockpit that assists the pilot in his tasks, a working partnership between man and machine. Sensors would monitor his brain function. And at times of stress, a computer could take control of the aircraft while the man concentrates on the business of combat. The super cockpit will not be a control panel at arm's length, but something the pilot wears. A special helmet where he receives all the information he needs to make his combat decisions. It's called the Virtual World Cockpit. Zoom. Zoomed. Normal. Normal. Okay, I've got uh, Soviet hind on me. Firing cannon. God's eye. God's eye. Information is projected, like Cinemascope and Technicolor, to the pilot so that uh, the information regarding where the targets are located in the outside world, where the friendly aircraft are located, uh, aircraft state information, Normal. is all projected into this three-dimensional world. 
and that is then augmented with a uh, three-dimensional sound so that the crew member will will hear the enemy and the direction that he's coming from when he talks to his wingman he will hear the wingman coming from that direction okay, i believe i got him when he has a problem with the aircraft, he'll have this little voice that comes in. It's his daughter's voice. And his daughter speaks to him and says, Daddy, you have a fire in your left engine. Normal. Normal. It may seem that uh, it's unusual to have uh, your daughter's voice speak to you in the cockpit, but that's exactly what we're trying to do, is to take something that normally would be out of context and put it into this battle so that we can grab the pilot's attention. Zoom. Zoomed. Normal. Normal. Are you ready to start to run? Uh, okay. The goal is still some way off, but the program has already had some payoffs. This helmet, for example, will help helicopter pilots fly and fight more effectively by day and night. We could look upon the video game culture as an opportunity to raise a new generation of warriors who will be able to live in a world that is largely computer generated. Pilots today are willing to trust their life to machinery that pilots a number of years ago wouldn't even conceive of doing. But what sort of fighter will the pilots of tomorrow fly? One thing is clear, it will be expensive. Back in World War II, a Mustang cost $56,000. This, the European fighter aircraft, due to come into service in the 90s, will have a price tag of $34 million. That's why it's being built by a consortium of nations. And that's why we'll have to perform many roles, from intercepting to ground attack. One airplane to carry out the jobs three or four did in World War II. Recent wars have shown how vulnerable fighters are to anti-aircraft missiles. Like the SR-71, still the world's best example of aeronautical stealth, tomorrow's fighters will need a shape to fly undetected by radar and avoid the dangers from the ground. Designers like Lockheed's Ben Rich believe that the fighter of the future will need another capability. We're going to have to worry about the enemy going after our landing fields. We're going to have to worry about how we're going to come home. In other words, if they go and knock out our fields, we need to have airplanes that have vertical landing capabilities. So the next generation will have what we call short takeoff and vertical landing. Already, some are questioning the need for manned fighter aircraft at all. As missiles become deadlier, as remote control vehicles develop, they foresee a time when a country can defend its skies without relying on pilots and expensive airplanes. The men in the cockpit naturally have a different view. Man and the history of man has never failed to beat a machine. And if something is predictable, I, even on my low level of knowledge, will beat it. I don't care what the scientists say. You need the computer that the dear Lord gave us right between our ears and behind our eyes. It's the best one yet. But with the technology of Star Wars on the horizon, even the most ardent flyer can see a future where the fighter pilot may no longer have a place in the sky. Once they start using particle beam weapons, when they start using laser technology, then I don't know if I want to put my butt in one of those airplanes or not. You know, if it's Buck Rogers, maybe it's time to put Cylons in 